Summary of The Biggest Game of All The Inside Strategies, Tactics, and Temperaments That Make Great Dealmakers Great By Leo Hindry, Jr. with Leslie Corley Why Big Deals? Academic researchers who proceed from the basic assumption that business people, indeed all people, are basically rational have long grappled with the contradictory evidence presented by mergers. Mergers usually destroy more value than they create. When the CEO of a company makes a run at acquiring another company, and pays, as is usual, a premium over the market price of the target's shares, the astute stock investor immediately sells the acquirer and buys the stock of the target. Such mergers normally represent an outright transfer of wealth from shareholders of the acquired company to shareholders of the target. Academics often ask why, in the face of overwhelming evidence, CEOs continue to do big deals. First-hand experience at the negotiating table suggests some compelling reasons, though not the kind of reasons that are apt to find their way into the business school curriculum. Incompetence, aka the shell game, consider Carly Fiorina, brought into the CEO's job at Hewlett-Packard, HP, when the company was foundering. She didn't improve the situation with her decision to buy a corporate jet, and feature herself in a series of television ads in which she pontificated about HP's traditions. She led HP's stock to new lows, and in desperation opted, as so many CEOs do, for a huge, head-line-grabbing, value-destroying merger with Compaq. Before she bought Compaq, she tried to buy a big consulting company. Pick a target, any target, seemed to be the strategy. Let the public keep its eyes on the deal-making prestidigitation and maybe it won't notice the managerial ineptness. Fear, the average CEO is terrified that someone will take over the company and replace him or her. Disney's Michael Eisner made his company takeover proof when he acquired ABC and gave the vocabulary of finance a new word, Disneyfy. To Disneyfy a firm means to make an acquisition so huge that no other acquirer could possibly swallow the combined entity. The AOL Time Warner deal was an example of disnification in action. Whatever the dubious merits of the deal might have been, Time Warner CEO Jerry Levin bought himself some job security for a while. Wall Street, when the stock market is willing to reward CEOs for bad deals, it's no wonder bad deals happen. Consider Tyco International, a diversified conglomer, eight that inflated its top-line revenues with 700 deals for about $7 billion from 1999 to 2001. The stock market never objected, perhaps only partly because of Tyco's poor disclosure. After all, the stock market cheered Cisco to new height after new height during a similarly aggressive acquisition campaign. Is it ever good to do a deal? In one sense, it's always good. Doing a big deal gives you a rush like cocaine, and it's about as addictive. But in terms of business strategy, a deal only makes sound sense for these reasons. Improvement, sometimes, you just have to do something to change, amplify, upgrade or better your company's asset base. Sometimes, improvement goes too far. Amazon did a really great job with its core business of books and CDS. It had a perfect business triangle of complementary product, distribution, and technology. But in an effort to improve, Amazon's founder and CEO Jeff Bezos tried to make it the wall mart of the web. The effort flopped. Scale, although scale may be a good reason to do a big deal, it is easier to find fail, use than successes. Consider the Ballyhoo Daimler Chrysler merger. Germany's Daimler and Detroit's Chrysler coveted each other for scale, but their cultures simply wouldn't mesh, their merger has fallen far short of initial hopes and hype. Change, sometimes, a business is just awful, and the only thing that makes much sense is getting another business. Former Westinghouse CEO Michael Jordan weathered strong criticism from the press, and the market when he sold off traditional industrial businesses and put all of his money on broadcasting and media. The day after Disney announced its merger with ABC, Westinghouse announced that it would acquire CBS for $5.8 billion, almost $2 billion more than Westinghouse's entire market value. Jordan stayed the course, created a media empire and sold CBS to Viacom for six times its purchase price. Who's who? Who are the biggest and best dealmakers? The list includes, without a doubt, Rupert Murdoch, the chairman of News Corporation, Murdoch has an extraordinarily long-range vision and immense creativity. 
He's a programming and marketing genius. Sumner Redstone, Viacom's chairman, Redstone is famous for hanging onto a hotel ledge during a fire, and burning his hand severely but surviving. He is equally tenacious when it comes to big deals. Mel Karmazin, Viacom's chief operating officer. Karmazin proposed the sale of CBS to Viacom when he was CEO of CBS. The two have had a rocky relationship but share a vision of the future and are both deal geniuses. Gerald Jerry Levin, as Time Warner chairman, he engineered the huge merger, $165 billion, of Time and AOL. Whatever its demerits, the deal brought AOL into the cable tent, and AOL promptly dropped its open access campaign once it owned its own cable system. John Malone, Liberty Media's chairman, Malone is an all time champion deal maker with an astounding grasp of complicated financial structures. Brian Roberts, Comcast's low key president, son of Comcast founder Ralph Rob Ertz, won his spot in the dealmaker's pantheon by derailing a planned IPO of ATT Broadband and snatching the prize from a reluctant AT&T CEO. Ted Turner, the entrepreneurial founder of CNN, his single most important deal was selling Turner Broadcasting to Time Warner. His eloquent, prescient, a brilliant strategist and a true visionary. Jack Welsh, the erstwhile chairman of General Electric, one of the greatest man agers of all time, did not do many deals himself, but he instilled a deal-making cull, Turing into GE. How do deals work? What does it take to succeed at deal making? Keep these important rules in mind. Work harder than your adversary, if you do more homework, you'll win. If you don't do your homework, you'll never know how much you lost. When Leo Hindry, Jr. was CEO of Telecommunications Incorporated, he was about to buy a cable system, but he had reservations about the owner's subscription data. He checked around the target neighborhoods and found that the figures included the population of a jail and a few medical centers. The seller may have included the institutions for a reason, since the price depended not only on subscriber population but also on the number of home units, a cell block, a hospital room. Hindry demanded an adjustment in the price, given that prisoners and patients were not likely subscribers, and the two sides deter, mind a more sensible price. The buyer's homework was worthwhile because the seller was a canny operator and would have lied if he could get away with it. Don't expect to change your partner, if cultures don't fit, they don't fit. The Dame Le Chrysler merger made sense on the basis of scale but ran aground on the rocks of culture. GE's disastrous merger with Kidder, Peabody was similarly doomed by cultural incompatibility. Make haste slowly, move as fast as you can, but don't throw caution and prudence to the wind. AT&T's Mike Armstrong mistakenly shoved too fast in the acquisition of TCI. His due diligence was faulty, he paid far too much and he ended up making a deal that surprised even the sellers. Surround yourself with good people, AT&T made another crucial error during its purchase of TCI. The company depended upon investment bankers who lacked expertise in the industry involved, cable TV, much to the glee of the sellers. Just walk away. If you really want a deal, this is hard. But walking away may get you what you want at a better price than you were willing to pay. It will certainly spare you embarrassment and protect you from the winner's curse, overpaying. Don't make enemies, have adversaries, sure, fight for your side and fight hard, but don't make long-term enemies. Every enemy you make is a potential friend to a future adversary. Don't lie, cheat or do other things that will cause people to harbor a long-term grudge. Play rough, but play fair. Read it before you sign it, Volkswagen AG paid $790 million to buy Rolls-Royce, the company with the best name in luxury automobiles. But apparently the VW negotiators didn't read the fine print. Rolls-Royce Motor Cars, Limited did not own the rights to the famous name. VW's rival, BMW, eventually bought the name rights for a relative pittance. Don't sweat the small stuff, sometimes people get carried away in a deal mac, in frenzy and keep pushing for small concessions just to see what they can get. Resist the temptation. It makes you look cheesy, and losing face weakens you at the negotiating table. Have an iron bottom, keep sitting at the table as long as you must. Never give up. Keep coming back. Endure. Call it perseverance, call it stubbornness, 
call it what you will, but develop it. Keep your counsel, it's not up to you to tell your negotiating adversaries when they've made a costly blunder. Keep your counsel and watch your money grow. Some notable deals. Some deals provide particularly noteworthy lessons and insights, among them. AT&T Broadband, AT&T Chairman Michael Armstrong rashly rejected an initial offer from Comcast, and wound up having to sell to Comcast anyway, later, when it became clear no one else wanted to buy the property. AT&T, TCI, TCI scooped money out of AT&T's pockets because AT&T disre, guard almost every negotiating and dealmaking rule. DirecTV, this is the merger that wasn't. Rupert Murdoch tried to buy DirecTV in 2000, but owner General Motors turned him down for another suitor. Then that deal, as might have been predicted, fell afoul of regulators. Murdoch, who has every right to feel cheated and lied to by the cable operators who reneged on earlier com commitments to him, will probably be back, possibly with DirecTV and probably with a vengeance. The big media deals described above may be history, but history has a tendency to repeat itself. The nature of the media industry almost dictates that it will continue to change, disintegrate and recombine in new configurations. Disney may be a target in the not-too-distant future. Immediately after its acquisition of ABC, Disney was takeover proof, but poor management has brought its stock so low that a hostile run is quite conceivable. Vivendi Universal will have to sell off some assets, that's the usual fate of disparate conglomerates, to fall on hard times and suffer dismemberment. No doubt there will be more big deals and more big dealmakers. But the principles behind the big deal are timeless, and the factors that spell success are constant.